Hello, welcome to Conversations with Kate. I am your host, Kate Jagedi. I am joined today by the incomparable Brian Scott. Yay! <laughs> I feel so lucky to have you, Brian. Thank you so much for being a guest on the program. So for those of you who don't know, I was interviewed by Brian uh, about six months ago or so on his YouTube channel, which is hugely successful. And I'm really excited that my um, interview was one of the more popular <laughs> ones on the channel. So that's fantastic. We're going to be talking about a wide range of things tonight. We'll also be talking about Neville Goddard. So without further ado, let's get into it. So what I'd like to do, Brian, this is a conversation. It's a back and forth. So you're free to ask any questions. I just mm -hmm. want there to be a nice organic flow between us, but I have to introduce you to the audience first, just in case we don't have any audience members in common. And I'm going to just read everyone the bio from Brian's website. So I'll leave a link to that beneath the video. So it says that Brian Scott is an author, motivational speaker, thought leader, life coach, transformation coach, influencer, podcast host for the Reality Revolution podcast and the Laptop Lifestyle podcast. And he is also an artist. If all of that wasn't enough, I caramba. <laughs> so Brian has studied and worked on consciousness expansion for over 20 years. His primary goal is to find that spark to unleash your greatest potential. He is the creator of the Aura Technique and the 77 Steps to Success. Brian created the Advanced Success Institute or ASI to gather the best experts in a variety of areas to help people overcome obstacles, unlock abundance, improve their health and improve their relationships, which are things that are important to all of us. ASI gathers advanced technologies using meditation, hypnosis, Qigong, which is one of my favorite techniques. I, I've been doing that for years. I absolutely love it. Reality transurfing, sensory deprivation, virtual reality, mind tech, quantum jumping, reality shifting, yoga, energy psychology, luck coaching, NLP, silver mind controls, something that was also introduced to me as a child and biohacking. So I see there's already a nice synergy, Brian. I think we're very much on the same page. So recognizing its influence as leading success coaches, the Advanced Success Institute strives to use its various platforms and reach for the public good. The company's commitment can be seen in many different forms, including community outreach and support, which is vital, and the support of multiple charities working toward the movement of the entire planet towards peace and love. Finding that spark of hope and love in each one of us. Thank you, Brian. I think that's just absolutely stunning. So before we get into the conversation proper, can you talk to me a bit about where the vision for this incredible work that you do came from? I think it's a nice starting point. Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, I'm honored to to be on your show, and I'm a huge fan of your book, and I learned so much. It was so nice to talk to you before. Uh, the The vision that I had was I had acquired. I'm just one of those those people that ac loves to acquire knowledge, <laughs> and I had this uh, near life near death incident that occurred, and after I came out of it, uh, I kind of had this this desire to help as many people as possible. I got in touch with that loving aspect of me that, uh, and I wanted to imagine a better world and be a part of it and do something to, to help. And so I started to imagine and come up with ways that I could uh, help people with the knowledge that I had gained. And, and that was the reason uh, that my vision has come together. It's still coming together, but uh, just the desire to help as many people as possible. Yeah. That's fantastic. It's really beautiful. And I do get a sense of that from you because you share such a wealth of information. And it sometimes happens mm -hmm. that people, as they start to acquire this type of knowledge, they get a little bit territorial about yes. it. I think mm -hmm. the things that I, I found, particularly in communities that love Neville Goddard, it's just jostling for position and sort of, I know more yes. about Neville than you do. But I yes. love the way that you are so generous with what you know and the way in which you share the information. So we'll be talking a bit more about your work on Neville a little bit later on in the conversation. Okay. So going back, you mentioned my book. I talk a bit about my childhood, the mm -hmm. influence that my mother had on me and how that shaped me in coming into contact with Neville Goddard with the philosophies mm -hmm. that he taught. Um, so in as far, well, can you tell me a bit about your early life in yeah. Uh, as far as it relates to you becoming the reality revolutionary that you are today? <laughs> well, I, I grew up in Wyoming, 
Uh, my dad was a veterinarian and my mom was a teacher. Uh, and I still, uh, the things that they both taught me are still a big part of what I am today. Uh, a desire to teach and how to teach for my mom, who was this fourth grade teacher, her, and she loved it. It was always surprising me how, how she could love something that seemed so boring to me, but now I understand. And my, my dad, being a veterinarian, had a, a sort of loving scientific view. Uh, he, he, he wanted to help um, animals, but he, he always came to me with the, the scientific uh, method in, uh, in evaluating things. So even as I became woo-woo and mystical, I still have that my dad saying, well, let's look at this scientifically. And so yeah, if, you, if you've seen my book, you, you see me going through the dad process at the beginning, trying to tell my, probably that, that chapter on physics is me tell, explaining to my dad <laughs> why there's the scientific background of what I'm talking about so that he would, and that I've kind of looked back on it and saying there's that dad aspect of me that I'm trying to explain. Uh, the, the scientific aspects of it, even though ultimately there may not be any science to it. <laughs> As Neville says, we're just looking at our own mind when we start to look at those things. But yes, um, that's kind of where I'm coming from, from my background. Um, yeah. That's so awesome. I, I love that blend of you know, the teacher and the veterinarian. I, I grew up in a household of, of teachers, so I, I really right. do get that There vibe. is something about it. The teacher, it becomes an identity, and there's more to it. There's just being the teacher. Yeah, it is. My dad even taught, he taught uh, in community college nearby, veterinary science. So I saw that and his desire that he had learned something and to teach it. And the big, as you have learned, the big discovery is uh, it's really a teach learning. Uh, if I really want to learn a subject, the best thing for me to do is is try to teach it. Uh, and and, and, and yeah. the more th that's kind of the secret weapon is that I'm I'm really just like anybody else that's learning. I'm just trying to teach it. And that gives me a leg up on trying to understand it. So, yeah, mm, I, I get it. And I, I really do get a sense of that passion for sharing knowledge and helping other yeah. people to know. And as you say, as we're teaching, we're learning. I said it to my mom all the time. She's right. like, wow, I love talking to you, even though I get so much from her. And right. I'm like, well, it's doing something for me as well. It's giving me an opportunity to sound out these ideas that are bouncing around in my yeah. own mind. And if I can communicate it to you and you're getting it, then it means that I understand it properly. So that's right. fantastic. Thank you for, for sharing um, that with me, Brian. So I want to talk to you about your podcast, which is hugely. Mm -hmm. No, actually, let's go back first. So. Yeah. Um, just to mention everybody watching, I've actually read Brian's book. I was lucky enough to be sent a copy by Brian. So I really appreciate that. And I love the fact that it's just so many different ideas. But um, as I said to you, I think I said privately in a message, it, it, it's mm -hmm. delivered in such a, a measured way. And, and you talk about the science background. And I think it's really impo uh, important that we strike that balance, that we don't mm -hmm. overlook the importance of the physical world. I talk mm -hmm. about the fact that the physical world is the expression of consciousness and operation? How else do we know what's right. going on in the realm of infinite creative potential? So what do you see the role of the physical world is in a, uh, as it relates to us understanding consciousness and the movement and operation of consciousness more fully? Well, as we grow up, all we ever really know as and believe in is what we see and experience in the physical world. It's that the physical world has been designed it personally feels intelligently so that there's always this mystery to it. And, and there is a scientific um, undergirding almost on purpose um, to create that, that level of confusion and mystery as we reach out for faith and understanding of what's going on around us. Uh, but we can see, even in the smallest things, a parable almost, or an example of what's happening on, on the larger scale. And um, oftentimes the, the scientific process of understanding you don't have to be scientific to do it it's just simply a t it's testing out uh truths that you believe that are true through experimentation and understanding and, and keeping my mind open and oftentimes i found stuff in science that is related to stuff i learned spiritually and then the melding of the two it seems to be a magnification or enhancement of what i had learned before uh, there's still that there's that dad part of me that's it's, that if I have some scientific backing, then I believe or have more faith in understanding, more passionate about it. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm so glad you put it like that, because some certainly some of the people that are new to this way of life, they kind of feel that they're not supposed to have any interest in the physical world or interest in scientific right. processes. And I try to encourage them, look, don't be nervous about it. Right. Look at it this way. 
science helps you to observe the invisible. It helps you to put some sort of measure on things to help you to really understand what's going on and actually makes the world of spirit, which when you first come to it, doesn't feel very tangible until you reach that crossover point where you've had enough experience. It's going to be science, scientific method that helps you, although we're not using science in the traditional way to sort of test and prove we're, we're, you know, working with this on faith. It does help us to measure yes. what's going on. We feel I, things, see things, we hear. Yeah, I sure, agree. There's like a dichotomy that that is uh, unfortunate. Um, I, I even had an ex that was you know, very religious that would just look at, at science as uh, the opposition of her beliefs. It's just not true. I think eventually, in the year twenty thousand, everything that we're talking about will have some scientific background to understand or explain it and, and sometimes we we go into a spiritual understanding of something because that's the best way for us to understand it within our limited framework and and eventually I mean they may be like yeah that's what was going on there is this and even then there may be levels uh, <laughs> if that makes any sense yeah but there isn't an opposition that science does not contradict Ultimately, I do not think they contradict. People believe, you see it in political parties too, this opposition, this pushing away of science as if it, as if it's a contradiction. It's not. Um, Ultimately, if you go down the road, ultimately, I think science ultimately melds and agrees with when you start to see the links, but it's still an interesting discussion and I'm still learning. So (laughs) (laughs) me too. It's exciting. And as I say, I mean, science, enables people to be wonderfully creative if people are yeah. interested. This is not a, a conversation about science, but I think it's important that people feel comfortable about the fact that, as you say, there's no opposition between this realm of consciousness that we are just learning mm-hmm. about and moving into and, and engaging right. with and the physical world, which for me is the expression of all that's going on in this invisible realm. So we'll talk about that probably another day. It's probably a whole... Yeah. Well, I think science is ignoring consciousness, and that is what is the biggest. Um, you, we, we get units of of matter like atoms and stuff, but we don't ever measure what's the smallest unit of consciousness. Consciousness yeah. is being ignored, and that's why what we're talking about is so important. Yeah, I t- I totally agree with you. So you talk about so many different things, as I mentioned in your bio. There are all these different methodologies, but yeah. I think one figure, one character that embodies the philosophy of, I would say, thought causation, which is the most important thing to me, yes. is the great Neville Goddard. He is yeah, so absolutely. tremendously popular. I completely understand why people love Neville Goddard. You know, my mum always says to me, people want to be safe. They want to feel secure. They want to be happy. Mm. They want to be loved. They want to know that they have the resources that they need to meet their needs. And then here comes this man who says, yes, you can have everything you need. And the, this resource is within you. Mm-hmm. It's if you know how to uh, release it, if you know how to use it, you can have the life you want. And I think that I think people can be get can become quite romantic in their uh, relationship to Neville, certainly in the beginning. <laughs> yes. What was your <laughs> experience of Neville when you first came into contact? And also, Brian, if you could tell us, when did you first come into contact with Neville's teachings and what was that early contact like? If you read the book, and I, you know, as you know, when you read a book, it takes forever to get. So uh, I'd really only read "Feeling Is the Secret," and I think that the second book that I pulled up was "Seed Time and Harvest," and I was like, "Oh man, this is all biblical," so I put it aside. Uh, and then when I came back to it after all that research and I did on the book, and Neville is taking all these complicated things I talked about. And making them so fun and easy. But more importantly, he's he's applying a an understanding of the Bible in which I had actually rejected. That dad part of me had said, Brian, you know, there's some stuff in here that contradicts. But now he's saying, oh, no, no, it's not what you think. And then it's like, oh, thank you. It's just this huge understanding. This He was uh, beautiful with the way that he used his language. It resonates when you when you hear... Neville Goddard, there's a passion, and it, it, you can just tell. There's, I'm, I have a BS detector. I think we all do. When you, <laughs> when you read or listen to Neville Goddard, there's no BS. Uh, for sure you know he believes it, but then when you start, as he says, don't believe me, test it. And you start testing his techniques, 
And what I, I might be taking a technique that I have maybe had taught before. It was so complicated. It had so many steps. And he just has this super easy. A lot of times that's what you'll get with people. They access Neville and they'll say, well, I was using this complicated uh, technique that I learned. But then Neville just, you know, boom, he made it sound so easy and for me to understand. That was the, the thing is he's teaching the same things I am. I believe he's teaching and utilizing the same concepts, which I talk about in the book, ma maneuvering through what I think are parallel realities. But he's making it, oh, it's just the simplest and easiest thing, just, you know, and, and, and the techniques that he have always work. You, you know, they're, they're just amazing. And a lot of times they're very unique, things that I had not thought about or that he's fleshed out. And then he's really added that spiritual, that spiritual confirmation that I need and pulled me back into these older biblical teachings because under it, as I now understand, there's secrets to life, incredible secrets that I did not realize that are buried, that he unlocked and unveiled that is so amazing. And another thing about Neville that we don't talk about, you, you know how you have Napoleon Hill has like a couple books, right? Mm -hmm. The really tragic thing about Napoleon Hill, there's only, there's not very much, but when you add all of the lectures and the books, there's just so much. That, that Neville Goddard dealt with. It's just amazing the amount of information. And that is what is so appealing to me. I'm, I've am i done like 100 episodes on Neville Goddard. I, I think I might have only scratched the surface. There's so much more that I can go over. Uh, and that's what's so exciting about it. Absolutely. I agree with you 100%. It's this yeah. feeling when you're reading his material of expansion that you get. And I am talking about yeah. feeling all the time. It's something I'm encouraging people mm -hmm. to actually begin to understand. And, and, and so I go on and on and on about it on my mm -hmm. YouTube channel, that there is a spiritual language of emotion and we should treat our feelings as the, as the vocabulary of that language. And, and I love that. I, I totally can relate to what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Now I have read your book bizarrely, I didn't think about the fact that you do talk about uh, your interest in Neville in the book. Um, so the book is The Reality Revolution. I will put a link to it uh, mm -hmm. underneath. And as you said, you have done 100 episodes on Neville Goddard or more. Um, I think you said Well, it or seems more. like something like that. Yeah. And you're, you were one of the first. <laughs> I started reading this going, oh, my God, there's so much. And I, I got to find an expert on this. So that's how I um, ended up interviewing you um, because... I realized this, that me just reading these lectures, I needed to get some more information. I'm still learning, so. My cat's meowing, so. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> That's fine. I have the neighbor's dog going on. Oh, okay. oh, gosh. Yeah. <laughs> Please, he just wants fine. to say he loves so, you, too, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Appreciate it. So one of the things that's really um, fantastic about Neville is, you know, he had all of these books and lectures. But it's him on the page. And, and I was going to say that your book felt very much like that, even though you're delivering mm -hmm. these very measured, really well written concepts and ideas and presenting them in the way that you do. It feels autobiographical. There feels like there is mm -hmm. Brian sort of interwoven through the pages. And this is the same thing with Neville's writing. You feel that, you know, the man himself. Mm -hmm. So on that note, the title of this episode is Neville Goddard with Totally Podcast. I want us to think about <laughs> Neville Goddard in 2020. So before it, I it, give you my take on <laughs> yeah. what I think he would be like, I want to hear what you think. Would Neville be into social media? How would he use it? Just what do you think about um, Neville Goddard today, well, the contemporary? Th th this is the craziest thing. I I've not really ever tell that to anybody this, but... Um, I'm an invisible believer in the in the invisible council that Napoleon Hill has, where he has these masterminds. And I have started to talk to Neville. I know that it's an aspect of my mind because I've read so much. And so I start, it's almost like you create an AI. When you read so many lectures, you kind of know how he will respond, what he thinks, what he'll do. And so I'll, I'll be like, okay, what lecture, Neville? What, what should I do next? Or... Uh, I will have a, a portion of Neville is saying, you know, and so um, I have had that thought that Neville has a sort of a, a humorous jealousy towards the podcaster because I got this feeling from a lot of his lectures. Once he had had his vision, he was kind of like, he enjoys his couple martinis and, and hanging out with his wife at home. He did this, he did the speeches as 
because he felt like he kind of had to. He wanted to spread the the, the news, but he was kind of like, um, yeah, I want to just hang out at home and uh, you know, and, and and hang out with my wife. And um, he did the speeches almost kind of out out of a, a, a necessity to spread this message of the experience that he had. And 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 I agree. If Neville was around today, he'd be busting out a, a couple podcasts and then going back <laughs> and hanging out with his wife, drinking a couple martinis, right? Um, and I and I. I, I know that we would probably had um, similar stuff and, uh, and his speeches come out like a podcast. A lot of times he's dealing with different. He has, a, he addresses it. And I, I agree with you 100%. It's the, 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 mo, the medium and the, the way it facilitates in the conversations that are involved. Absolutely. 100%. <laughs> so, so before I, what I tell you what I think, because obviously the yeah. title is called never got up a totally podcast. So I right. can, I just have a, a complete, well, an idea about the way he would get down in 2020. Yeah. I want to ask you something which actually was inspired by what you just said. Mm-hmm. You referred to these communications with Neville as being an AI. Do you not think that you are actually communicating with him? Is that something oh, you can allow yourself to believe? Oh, the, the, I allow myself to believe that. There's a portion of me that says, well, maybe not. It's so real. <laughs> it's so real. Like, um, it started when he started talking, when he started, I reading him, his lectures, and he talks about com- communicating with Blake and communicating with Paul. And after I read his lecture on him communicating and meeting Blake, and then I went and read uh, The Marriage Between Heaven and Hell on my podcast, as in, inspired by his discussion of Blake, all of a sudden I have Blake talking to me. <laughs> and so, and then I'm um, very much after that, after I'd gotten into a lecture. And uh, the interesting thing is, I had was reading along with one of his lectures, and I messed up like a couple sentences. And I felt corrected, like, oh, you, you can do anything you want, please do not mess up the words that I had, even if they are incorrect. Like I might have had a self correction or said something or cut a word off on accident when you're when you're in the moment. And I felt corrected, like I had to pause it. And like, okay, like he was like friendly, <laughs> he was friendly, stern with me saying, don't mess up. I, I said everything for a reason. Whatever you do, just, just say the words exactly the way. Oh, and I'm okay. And, and then I, later on, I read him say that in a question and answer session that somebody came up to him and said, you know, that, that wrote down his speeches. And he said, uh, kind of like, eh, just whatever you do, you can do whatever you do. Just don't mess up my words. And so it was mm-hmm. so crazy that afterwards that he had said that. <laughs> so I, I want him to be real. And in my heart, he is real. But the, 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 this part of me that, that wants to retain my sanity says, well, maybe um, he's real and, and maybe not, but either way. Um, and like, that's what Napoleon Hill said. Napoleon Hill would have conversations with Abraham Lincoln all the time. Mm-hmm. And then he said, I know it's not Abraham Lincoln, but it feels like it to me. And I'm, a, I'm, I'm, I'm on the, you know, in, in my vision, Neville's way, you know, this is his, as he describes hell. So if he is here, uh, he's probably, you know, he has more important, bigger, huger, <laughs> greater in his, things as he talks about. But uh, if it is, wow, I w- I'm honored that he spent the time with me and, and, and what an incredible thing. Have you had, an, an, had a similar circumstance of feeling like oh, Neville's God. right there? Okay, okay, so then maybe there's something. Yeah. But one thing I would say is that it is no accident that you do what you do. It's no accident that you have the audience that you have. I just want to jump back before I come back to talk about this to say that I absolutely agree with you. Neville got what life was all about. And so Mm. I think once he had had his experience, he was incorporated into the body of love. He Mm. was fully fused with the blueprint of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. He didn't have to figure things out in a way that the rest of us still have to. There was there wasn't the mystery, the layer of mystery there for him. Just about the use of consciousness and being the vessel or the expression of consciousness in its different ways. And I love the fact that he could travel and he had all of these mystical experiences. Mm -hmm. I also love the fact that he was very human. And I'm going to talk about that in a moment. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to say to you, Brian. Mm-hmm. Not to dig your feet into the carpet and hold on to the chair, you know, to right, right. And yourself with the profundity of things and just let loose. I, I, yeah, I don't exactly. tell people what to do. I, I deliver messages on my channel, right. but there, I, I want to encourage you and thereby encourage the people listening to this conversation 
that if you are being spoken to, you are being spoken to. Well, it's and interesting is... when you make that comparison. I don't mean to interrupt you, but um, the, fine, per, the, the person he, he was referring to that dug his feet in was Israel Regardi, one of the um, one of the great writers about magic of all people <laughs> that would be digging their feet in. This person that that wrote about magic um, is amazing. So, yeah, I mean, I, I feel Israel Regardi. I've had I've dug my feet in. I think that Neville's talking to everybody a little bit when he makes that comment that everybody digs their feet in a little bit. But, yeah. <laughs> Here you are with this hugely successful YouTube channel delivering the information. And mm -hmm. there are people who, um, this is not a slight on anybody in any way, shape or form, but don't have the success you have and are yet so, you know, protective. You being yeah. somebody having that gener uh, generosity of spirit have been gifted the ability to spread this message. So it's not by accident that you do well, what you do. And so I just want you to have full assurance that you are having these conversations. Oh, wow. And that, and Bruce, that's exciting. I wanted to know, well, I wanted to know, and you said it, you were corrected while you were working with this uh -huh. material. That's not vague. That is not an accident. Right. That is telling you that, yeah, this experience is absolutely real. So going back to, to Neville now, <laughs> Neville in 2020. Yeah. I love the human side of him. I love the whole yes. of Neville God. I think people um, can, and I've been guilty of it. I don't want to sort of say I know what other people are thinking or feeling, right. but there can be this sort of deification of people that, oh my goodness, yes. he's otherworldly. But he said, I'm a normal, natural human being. He was prone to fits of temper when, it, when the occasion arose. I think he had a, a, an acerbic wit. I think he could have, he could be harsh. Mm -hmm. His wife even talked about the fact that he seemed to have no filter. And right. I could just imagine him putting some of our leaders in their place. And he would have done it in such spectacular fashion. Um, he's going to be think about yeah. Neville Goddard coming out with quips yeah. for President Trump. That would have been something yes. to be <laughs> you see, You see hints of him, how he would deal with today in multiple yeah. lectures because there were similar situations. Uh, but the, his his humor is unique in and of itself. It's a Neville humor. And um, some of the funniest uh, things that you're talking about come out in the question and answer sessions. For instance, his story of the Jehovah Witnesses, if you've read that one, when the Jehovah Witness, and then um, the, the, the jokes and stuff that he says to them. I, I, I agree with you, yes. Um, it would have been fascinating to hear how he took, but he, but he, uh, he had a diplomatic way of pointing it out. It was never insulting, but it was sort of, uh, yeah. it wasn't condescending. I can't explain the exact words for it because it was very, uh, author authoritative. When you're hearing him, you, uh, there's a certain authority that comes with it. It's not just his opinion. There's something a little bit more to it, if that makes sense. So that makes Perfect sense. When yeah. you said, sorry to cut you, when you said, yeah. um, I can't quite think of the word, the word that came into my field of consciousness immediately was authority. He's speaking with authority. Right. Yeah. And, and this is the thing, you know, I recorded, you're the second episode of Conversations with Kate, but I've been recording other episodes. Yeah. And um, I have one that's coming up that I'm really excited about because I'm talking mm. to a government minister, you know, a member oh, of the wow. House of Lords. Right. And, and it was so wonderful to have a conversation with someone like that, who is a man mm -hmm. of science, who is a, a person with a distinguished political career. But mm -hmm. what I did was I said what I said with authority because mm -hmm. it was based, sorry about the light there, it was based no, on my experience and, and what I know. And that's what some, something I really encourage people to do, not to be wishy-washy. Mm -hmm. right. Don't worry about who knows, who doesn't know, who cares, who doesn't care. You could be the only person in your family doing this sort of thing yes. but if you are confident confident about what you know your confidence will make room for you we talk about your gift will make room for you i'd say your confidence your sense of authority will make room for you because we are saying that these are absolute truths which seems almost inconceivable for any human being to to, to speak in terms of um absolutes mm -hmm. but i'm saying that thought causation the fundamentals of of all of existence is an absolute mm -hmm. truth so i think people should be confident about that. So on that note, this kind of idea of sort of being the only person, the only voice in the room, sharing this right. sort of thing, 
is are these ideas the ideas you share in your podcast something that is a family endeavor for you or are you sort of the long beard of the family (laughs) it's interesting the reason one of the reasons my podcast came so late for me i think there was a part of me that kind of waited both of my parents are gone now i think there was a part of me that waited until they were gone i felt like if i would have been doing this podcast and my mom would have been listening I would have been, I, first, it would never come out this thing. I would have been judging myself the whole time. What is my mom going to think? Of, or what is my dad going to think? And, and it was almost, there was a freeing that occurred after they, they were gone that I, okay, I can talk about this. I don't know why that is, but uh, they, my, my, they were both, my dad was uh, not really a, a, of any religious persuasion. Uh, I think that he believed uh, on, on some level, but it wasn't important to him. My mom was a Methodist, but uh, it was never, it, it was, it, I was in a f- sort of non-religious family, uh, that didn't take this stuff as important. We didn't talk about it at the dinner table. It wasn't really a part of our discussion. Uh, and, and the big, the best thing my mom said is I don't want to tell you what to believe. And that was the thing I appreciate the most is she didn't push any ideas down. She was cool with me going out and seeking and reading as much as possible. And a lot of my early years were, I, I, was the seeking like I, I need to, I need to know everything possible about God and I'll read everything that even if it contradicts and I and I went through a long period of just trying to read everything uh, and so I think that I give that to my parents because of that but it, it was never anything like you had the, I would have been so fortunate to be like you where your mom is teaching you this stuff at an early age oh my gosh I wish that I could have had this information at an earlier age it would have saved decades of my life. <laughs> some of the things I've been through and the realities that I created that I didn't have to, but I guess it was all for a, a purpose, right? <laughs> Absolutely. It's so yeah. funny. You know, there are no accidents. I was talking to you before we came on air that, you know, I have production notes, I have questions. I yeah. just threw my <laughs> notes right. on the floor. And and it's really important. I, I am certain that there's going to be someone listening to this conversation yes. who is thinking, what do I do? I get mess the questions about it mm-hmm. think about um I'm, I'm half nigerian and um nigeria can be a very conservative place although mm-hmm. uh it has its history its traditions uh, uh mm-hmm. of magic and, and all of that sort of thing it, its own interpretation on on invisible forces and power and all that kind of thing they can be very very i think nigerians particularly europe in the yoruba tribe very very closed-minded when it comes to exploring these ideas so i've had emails being here in Nigeria and Lagos mm-hmm. um, from people saying, I don't know, I love this stuff, but I have to hide it from my parents and things like that. So mm-hmm. it's really exciting to hear you talk about it so people don't feel so mm-hmm. alone. And I mention off the back of that, that our relationships with the people in our lives are dynamics that teach us things. They, so they through, are. You, learned, uh, you, you developed your sense of self. And look what you're doing today. It's absolutely incredible. And it's interesting that you mentioned my family Although, mm-hmm. you know, we were all given this information, I was the only one that ran with it oh, of okay. my siblings. So I have siblings who were traditionally very successful. I was not successful in the uh-huh. way that they were. I did terribly at college, at university. <laughs> and I right. don't care who knows that. Right, right. All I cared about, this is all I thought about. I, My younger sister, she's in the middle of, she's doing her, her PhD right now. Right. She has a, fabulously large house you know the perfect right. life uh-huh. although she really does apply these techniques for her doing the right thing you know doing your homework on time and getting right. a good degree <laughs> and going on and do, getting your master's and her phd right. and a house all of those things made sense everybody used to say what is Catherine's problem like kate's problem she doesn't have a job she doesn't seem to care about what's going on in the world but yeah. I was just completely lost in this philosophy. So we all have different experiences mm-hmm. of this um, type of thing. But like I say, one doesn't have to come at the expense of the other. I just just love yeah, the fact I, that I, I agree with that. Yeah. <laughs> to be kind of really boho about it. OK, let's uh, <laughs> moving the, 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 the conversation on your podcast is fantastic. You are sharing lots Thanks. of um, wonderful ideas methodologies techniques all mm-hmm. of just giving us so much information are you thinking about doing anything differently in the immediate 
in the immediate future or do you see that no this is good and and I'm good I just have a sense that something different is brewing I don't know where that came from that's just coming to my I have all well. kinds of different plans and thoughts of stuff in the future um and and they're still um their ideas but the most unusual thing as I found with my podcast I it, 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 the episodes that are most successful and the things that work out for the best for me are the ones that I that happen in the moment. I'll sit down and say, "Okay, I need to record another episode." Neville, what should I do? Neville will record. Will recommend or Neville will recommend something that's not one of his speeches. Like I, I asked Neville what I should do, and next thing you know, I'm reading Joseph Benner um, in his in personal life or. Um, something will come to me, um, and I have discovered books or things to talk about that I had no clue that, or maybe that had just sparked my mind. So I have th plans. I have a training program, uh, to help people. That's a little more detailed that kind of encapsulates a lot of the stuff that I'm doing. Um, and I'm working on a book with, uh, a friend of mine. And also we, we talked about, um, exploring the world of Neville Goddard's personal stories as a story to me fascinates me because there's so many interesting stories that kind of built up and, and created him that I find interesting from his own speeches that I want to put together. Um, so those, those are all things, but uh, <clears throat> I've probably bit off more than I can chew. So um, I'm just uh, digesting it and, and working it out, but um, it's fun and exciting. There's so many different possibilities, of course, um, as long as I have this platform, I'm going to definitely use it because I'm interested and I want to expand and I, and I want to teach and I want to learn at the same time. And it's so much fun to be able to share it because I was doing the same thing before my channel. I was exploring and reading in the same manner. I just wasn't sharing it. Um, I had the same passion. I was reading these lectures just like I am now. And, but I was, it was all to myself. So it's really cool as I can, I'm, I'm learning. It's like, I'm reading something and then I get to share it with a whole bunch of other people. And then we get to, you know, and so there's something about it that is so wonderful. It's one of the coolest things ever. Um, and I'm, and, uh, I am excited. There's one cool thing that, um, uh, if you listen to my podcast, one of the greatest things is the music. And uh, my friend, Brian Larson, who is the, he has a channel called Metaverse, we want to do a live show. So um, I'm imagining that because that would imply that things are getting better, too. So to do, mm -hmm. a, um, to do a live show with music and live meditations um, and, 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 and to take it to that level, to make, the, uh, to make it a live and natural event, um, I, I might read Neville Goddard lectures or, or do more and move my own lectures. And so... All of those things are 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 planted seeds, <laughs> and I'm incredibly excited about them all. And I'm sure that I'll have more. But one idea that I'm really wanting to expand—I don't know if it'll book or not—is the is this sort of open source spirituality. Uh, I, I've never been limited to one idea. Neville Goddard is important, and so I want to put all the things I learned about Neville Goddard, and then if somebody else comes along, Gurdjieff or um, Vadim Zeeland or Napoleon Hill, I want to put them all together. A lot of times what I see on YouTube or other places, everybody goes in their lane. I'm just new thought authors, and that's all I do is new thought authors, or um, I just do neurolinguistic programming, and what if it's all at all? And so how do we assemble all this stuff together? And so a lot of times, if you hear my podcast, you hear me trying to do that. I'm saying, well, I heard I, in reality trans surfing and in this book over here in this book, because they all do start to synthesize. And there's some kind of something even greater, a, a sort of literary mastermind that is occurring when you start to bring all these things together. And that is exciting. I think we're just starting to kind of compile this stuff together into something greater, which is exciting. Absolutely. Absolutely exciting. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I felt <laughs> such a charge when you spoke about your live show. And mm -hmm. that's fantastic. Instantly saw it. I, I totally get the setup. All right. And it's going to be a fantastic experience for people. Yeah. And I love what you said about this open source. One of the things I, I say to people about the outlines that exist around us and around things mm -hmm. is just because consciousness has infinite ways of expressing it itself, yes. of working, of functioning. But when we are working on the level of consciousness, when we are trading in the currency of emotion and communicating mm -hmm. it using that language as well, all of those outlines disappear. 
and we go back to that single source, that open yes. source, which is formless. It is not just new thought authors and, and, and all the sort of things that you've said. And so this is the thing that really, for me, that inspires me the most that I'm, I'm really incredibly passionate about is mm -hmm. people using the spiritual language of emotion and entering yes. into the realm of consciousness through their emotion so that all of these barriers that we have erected start to disappear. And I'm not saying that for the purpose of, oh, let's all get together and have a wonderful time in the world. Mm -hmm. I'm saying that because once you recognize yourself as part of the formless whole, you start to break down your own internal barriers about what you believe yes. is possible. So for me, I have had the most tremendous experiences. I've mm -hmm. spoken about some of them, but I find myself in the most weird and wonderful places, like <laughs> the most unqualified to be there. I, I took part in right. a conference at the Houses of Parliament in the UK. Oh, wow. With all these scholars and, you know, world leaders and people from the Arab world, you know, and it was incredible. Oh, wow. And uh -huh. it's me sitting there, you know. <laughs> right. And because I think myself into spaces. If I were to think about myself as right. Kate, there would be a thousand reasons why I wouldn't belong in certain places. Of course, but right. the actual me, the superior aspect of me, which is actually the topic of a, an upload I, I just put up on mm -hmm. YouTube, but that won't make sense when people watch this, but um, the, uh, the upload on the duality of man, that aspect of me knows that there are no such barriers. And so my yes. being there is going to give me something energetically. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not going to stop myself from being there. Okay, so on that note, Brian, we're going to wrap yeah. up the conversation soon. But I think actually this will be a great way to mm -hmm. wrap up the conversation. What is your daily lived experience of the movement of consciousness? It's constantly expanding. I, 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 I do not go a day where I, I think I know. Um, my daily expansion is, is uh, creating a daily routine that I have that I kind of kind of fall back on a little bit that has worked for me and then the acquisition of additional knowledge and then testing something that I, if some people follow my podcast I'm I enjoy experimenting with this stuff it's fun so if Neville tells me oh you got to try this technique where you enter in somebody else's body and imagine something great for them I'm going to run right over and I'm going to try that right away and so I have my basic routine that I that I do that has really worked for me. And then I'm also testing and constantly adding new routines and gathering information. And so uh, it's my current con is is constant expansion right now. At least I'm in a position where it feels like I learn something new or add something to my understanding every day. And how exciting is that? Who would have thought a year ago from what I understood and how would I understand now? Um, and so that that's probably the best way that I can explain it. But what, my, my question for you is how has it changed since you wrote the book about Neville? Has your, has your understanding of consciousness as you described it ex changed or expanded or added on or is it still the same? That's a really excellent question. At the time of writing the book, um, that was the culmination of me keeping journals over the course of many years. Mm -hmm. So I was experimenting with these ideas. And, and then I put together this little power pack because I'm a bit weird like that. I like having this kind of little book that I can refer right. to and everything I need is there. I just want it in one mm -hmm. place. I just I, I can't fathom having to go places to look for information. Right. So that the book, writing the book made perfect sense. And this is, yeah. yeah, this is it. But what happened as a result of writing the book was that I was people were starting to ask me questions and ask me to do things for them. And I was very much put on the spot a lot of the time because it's not something that you can prepare for. If someone you don't know just shows up and asks you, oh, can you help me with this? Or, you know, my wife's about to walk out of the door or I haven't got any money. Or mm -hmm. And so it was challenging the idea. I mean, Florence Scovel Shin talked about parlor practitioners where when we're in the safety of our own home or among people we know and love we're confident with these with these ideas you know we are right. experts in these philosophies we know all about these philosophies we're experts in the technique but when you step through your front door you're suddenly a jellyfish and you don't know what to do exactly and so I suddenly felt that okay people are going to be looking at me and checking whether I'm telling the truth that's to right. say I'm able to do the sorts of things that I tell them they're going to be able to do. Right. It, what I did, my approach to that was to challenge myself in new ways, 
to go for things I couldn't ordinarily get, mm -hmm. um, whether that was forming some new relationship with someone or, or being invited to do. OK, I'll give you an example. Mm -hmm. I am not a trained social scientist. But I cared about knife crime in London. The next thing I know, I'm being invited to have conversations with the deputy commissioner of the Metropolitan Police Service. And I'm being invited to take part in research and to join a governmental uh, interparty or cross party committee mm -hmm. where we're being asked, uh, you know, a, a wide variety of people from different backgrounds being asked to help solve this issue of knife crime. I can't I can't trace what I did or what I said or who I met that got me to that position other than I was aware that my opinion was needed my mm -hmm. outlook my perspective my metaphysical perspective was needed mm -hmm. and that what needed to be inserted into the discourse on things like knife crime was not just about people's socioeconomic background or racial tensions or whatever it might be or run-ins with the police and all that sort of thing but how people felt about themselves day, day to day they're feeling Concept correct exactly mm -hmm. do you feel that you are worth anything if yeah. you don't feel like that then don't be surprised if people treat you as worthless and yeah. it was amazing to see different people actually not just hearing me but accepting me and beginning to consider how they could apply what I was saying to the work that they were trying to do right and so I was invited to take part in academic research and, and it went very very far that is mm -hmm. not my back at all right. but this is the kind of thing I'm talking about listen if I want to be involved in policy that's going to save someone's life just because that desire is impressed upon me I've reached a point where I have the confidence to say, look, I'm going to neutralize my doubt on this issue and I'm right. just going to move forward with it. So that's what I decided to do to take it out of, oh, I need a hundred bucks, you know, this week or, you know, I want right. someone to like me to, I am going to change the law or I am going right. to. Right. Bigger thing. Exactly. Who yeah. is the person holding the position of power? I get, I'm a member of the Liberal Democratic Party in the UK. Mm. I told that party that their strategy for the election during Brexit was all wrong and I was proven right. Right. It, it's this kind of thing. It's an understanding, a be, an ability to actually connect with people on an energetic level mm -hmm. or to read, to be intuitive about how people feel about things and being able to respond appropriately to what people are saying with their feelings. I'm all about the language of emotion. I'm, right. That is what it's all about. And if you use that language, you're going to be able to see what's going on in the world. And your role in being the solution, if any, is going to be revealed to you. And by fulfilling it, as Neville says, you fulfill a desire, you're taken to a state that's superior to the one you're presently in. So we're right. moving to higher and higher levels. So that's what it's been like for me. It's changed a great deal because I'm, I'm suddenly feeling, you know, I'm, I can do this. And I'm right. going to do it. <laughs> now, I have to ask you before we go, because you said we're uh, keep going. But um, the, the thing that if I had you on to interview you now, when I first spoke with you, I, my, I had a rudimentary understanding of Neville. And now there is two Nevilles. There's kind of two Nevilles floating around now that I've read. Um, and and I, even my response to Neville lectures is there's two Oh, I love those. And even he talks about it in his lectures that, pe that people in his audience would ask him. So he would talk about the law and imagination creating reality. And then he would talk about the promise. It's this whole other world that maybe and I and so since since you're here, I got to ask and talk about it. He goes through in the eternal plan and several um, wonderful lectures, a list of visual visions and experiences that he had that he he's holding a baby. That it, 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 he's holding a baby, a dove kisses him. He meets uh, in the divine council. He meets love and is fused, and he uses this word "fused" a lot. And he talks about the one thousand two hundred and sixty days. So a lot of people that are reading Neville, uh, oh, 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 oh no, this sounds crazy. It's so completely different. So uh, help me to understand the promise. I don't understand it complete. I, I'm understanding it more and more. Uh, he even had people on his speaking tour that said, look, man, if you're going to keep on talking about this, I don't know if I can book as many speaking. And he was like, whatever. So <laughs> it, 
can you help me to understand it? And, and it, he is so dead set 100%. This is not a dream I had. Mm -hmm. This is 100% the truth. And he is claiming other people went through it. So I get these questions about Neville. And, and so I ask you, can, for, have you met people that have had these visions, first of all? Um, I haven't met anyone who's had the vision myself. I've had people uh -huh. who said, I've had this dream. Do you think this might be it? And so I said right. to them, okay, go back through what Neville says, look at the detail, see how right. things um, match up. Because sometimes people are really keen to have these ex experiences right. and they can be sort of crafting it within their own mind. But I do want to uh, say this. Neville is very clear. He says, put first things first. I think for people who want to attain to the promise, they need to understand that every time we use our imagination consciously, he said, we are building up within ourselves a core of power, a center of power, which right at um, a certain level of intensity, for lack of a better word, is going to set off the sequence of events. Okay, we so need that, to be, right. That, we need okay, to I got the implication that mm -hmm. all the other work is leading us. If you want yes. to get to the promise, then work on your imagination. So thank you for <laughs> making that link because sometimes he implies there's nothing you can do about it. He implies, yeah. It's just going to happen and there's nothing. I, I think that he's also implying that it will happen as you expand your imagination. So thank you for making that. that no problem. That but I do want to say this. It's very funny that you asked that because that was one of the questions that I wrote down for you, even though I didn't come back to it. <laughs> right. So uh, we've come back to it in, in this conversation. What I was going to say is I can see all the work that you're doing, but I really have a sense that you are looking at this other side to the story. Yes. I, I really feel that from you that you mm -hmm. are waiting for this event to happen I don't talk about the experiences that I've had they are right. sacrosanct to me. I'm waiting for certain things to be complete before I right. share and I don't even know that I will be authorized to share it I don't I get the sense right. that I'm sure I've read this in Neville maybe I heard it from Neville himself that there are people who have had this experience but they might not necessarily be existing in the same time uh, era that we are right. existing in right now because we know from quantum physics that all times are happening simultaneously right, right now as we're sitting here right. 1907 is happening year 30 31 is happening right. year 2008 is happening all of that is happening simultaneously so it may just be that we're not consciously aware in 2020 of anybody who's had that experience uh, but whether that is the case or not I think we shouldn't I don't say shouldn't, but this is how I feel about it. One shouldn't worry about worry getting about evidence from other people okay. and actually feel confident about having that experience unfold within yourself. It could be okay. that you have it and you end up talking about it. And right. maybe that your, your platform is for it. It could be that I be the one. I don't know. It could be someone right. we've never even heard of who suddenly appears on the scene. So I have had experiences. I, I would but actually talk wanna... to you about <laughs> Yeah, right. privately. Um, but I do want to wrap up this conversation. I can't tell you how much I before. Can, we, can I one more thing? <laughs> yes, do I have? Yes. Can I ask for? I, I, I got to ask while I have you. Please, <laughs> please let's talk about his uh, explanation of the afterlife. Uh, he talks about it's not necessarily reincarnation, but you're reborn into a body when you're that you're 20 years old. I see I see glimpses of this in Swedenborg's writing, who Blake talks about Swedenborg. Swedenborg says that's what happens when we die. We wake up and we're 20. We don't even remember our death and we just keep on going. Now, this is important to me because I had this near-death experience. There's a part of me that feels like I might have died when that happened. And so am, do we go to a virtual heaven or is it just another part of the timeline? Please help me, just even if I have a minute before you go, help me to understand this conception of the afterlife that he explains yeah fantastic so we cycle and this is one of the things right. that uh, helps us to really understand um our dynamics as human beings so uh -huh. you can reappear as someone as a different gender as a different ethnicity and so this is one of the things every time we are in this this type of packaging every time we take on a human expression it, mm -hmm. we're going to experience the world differently and that's we're going to learn different things right so you right. as brian are going to learn a whole different set of things than if you the actual you were wearing a different costume your experience of the world be, would be completely different to the experience okay. of the world that you're having right now 
how do I put this? But we magically appear when we're 20. We don't, we don't, we don't have a childhood anymore. So I'm, I'm, what I have come to understand is that it is not literally a 20 year old person mm -hmm. in that sense. Because if you think about it, when he says nothing's missing and all of that, well, then that doesn't account for people who are born with things missing or who are severely disabled, um, right. things like that. So it, it is talking to a, another being, another aspect of ourselves, okay. which I think that's, that's actually giving me an idea that something I can get clear in my own mind about. Well, I, I am right. clear, but I put it into language and actually make that as a YouTube upload. I think that might be Yes, something I can't wait. I'll be watching it. Would be <laughs> really valuable yeah. for people. But it, it's this um, process that we go through every time we are regenerated or we are, he doesn't use the word reincarnated when right. we're born. It is to continue our journey of education, the process of education okay. that we are going through as human beings. Okay. We wear many suits throughout the time allotted to us. At the end, we are res resurrected or reunited right. with consciousness. So we put off the limited human being. So um, that's something that I think needs a lot more explanation. And, and yes. I'm going to do it justice by, by trying to kind of. Right. Well, thank you for answering at least a little bit, because I'm fascinated by that. Because I want to know, am I in, in a real earth or is this some, some sort of matrix that's set up for me after I had died to continue my growth towards awakening? I mean, there's implications of that. And I don't know, you know, he says he meets 20 year old people and says, yeah, you were dead. So maybe he had some foreknowledge after he was awakened. He can see people that had already died. Is that what he's implying? I mean, he, he's able to travel because he operates as his body of consciousness. He operates outside of right. the limitations of his objective being. But it's really interesting that you you talk about this. This is something that a lot of people shy away from right. because it's sort of well, all I want to know is about how do I get all the goodies that I've ever right, right. Um, This spiritual stuff, um, I think, can be quite frightening for some people. But I think it's yes. fascinating. It's certainly worth um, investigating. And I and I I was thinking I was building up to. The oh, sorry. <laughs> no, it's absolutely fine. But I'm thinking if people are ready for it, if there's there are no accidents, you you didn't right. bring this up um by accident this has been an absolutely tremendous conversation i wish i could talk yes. to you all night and maybe we need to have Thank another you. yes sort of, for uh, sure <laughs> conversation Please. with kate part part two in which we actually just thrash out these more esoteric I yes. ideas uh, Brian, I can't thank you enough for this thank conversation you. this evening we've covered a, a lot as i said i will actually start to really give serious consideration to doing um, YouTube content on the more esoteric ideas of Neville. I think it's um, certainly needful for people who are ready to move on to that I stage. Can't wait, yeah. Um, but for now, let's wrap up this conversation. Brian, <laughs> I've been speaking to the fabulous Brian Scott. I'm going to put a link to Brian's book. I mean, your audience is so huge. It's unlikely that anyone listening oh. to me hasn't heard of you. But still, I'm going to put a link to Brian's book under this video and to his website and to his YouTube channel. Brian, this has been phenomenal. I've enjoyed it and I look forward to talking to you. I'll probably talk to you a little bit more after we go off air. Yes. <laughs> thank you for thank being you, here. Thank you, Kate, so much. I appreciate it so much. Your words were so kind. I Thank you. <laughs> okay.